Before we jump into our Bible study for tonight, we do want to keep encouraging you to stay connected with us throughout the week. As you can see, we have plenty of daily groups you can hop in via Zoom and YouTube. From women's Bible study to Access Young Adults, Access Youth, men's Bible study, and more. We have you covered to make sure you're not spiritually distancing yourself. Be sure to stay connected one way or another, and please check our social media pages for prayer requests, news, and further encouragement. We would also like to take this time and ask if you'd like to tithe or give an offering. You can do that by texting your amount to the number you see on the screen, entering your amount to our accessny.org slash give site, or mailing it to the address you see on the screen. Hey everybody, in case you don't know, this is Pastor Kyle Watkins. And this man standing next to me is Pastor Anthony Palella. And we wanted to let you know about something really special that's coming up real soon. Pastor, tell them all about it. Sure. Wednesday night, September 2nd, that's Wednesday night, Cedar Beach, Mount Sinai, we are having a baptism worship experience. It's going to be Word, worship, and a baptism that you will not soon forget. It's going to be amazing, Pastor Anthony. I'm so excited about it. It's awesome. This 7 p.m. event is going to be our first midweek service gathering together. We've been doing a lot of Sundays, but now it's time for all those who may be giving their lives to Jesus during the pandemic to step up and publicly declare their love for Jesus Christ. It's going to be so cool. Outdoors, singing, hearing the word. Oh, it's just going to be a moment that no one will forget. You don't want to miss out on this. Just want to remind you again, that's Wednesday night, September 2nd at 7 p.m. We want to get there a little early so we can park our cars, we can get on that beach, we'll lift up the name of Jesus. Listen, for those of you at Axis Church Patchogue, find us on our link at Axis Church Patchogue, our Facebook page. The link will be there. You can sign up or you can sign up in the foyer. And with Axis Medford, you can visit us at info at accessmy.org. Hit us with an email if you're interested in being baptized, or you as well can sign up Sunday morning right here at the church. It's gonna be awesome, Pastor. I'm excited. I'm excited. I can't, I can't wait. Sweet. I like, what was that? In the That's name. the baptism. The name. That's the baptism. the baptism. Thank you for this day. Thank you for just the day-to-day -day miracles that we have. Thank you for all things good and for all things beautiful that come from you. Thank you for the, the progress that we're seeing in our community and in our lives to just push back to being normal again. We thank you, Jesus. We present to you just everything right now in our lives. We present to you our community, God, the leadership in our community, our church, our pastors. May you just give them wisdom to continue to help us get back to normal. God, we thank you for these moments where we feel like we can just draw close to you in our time with you. And right now, we just want to celebrate that and spend time with you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.
yes I will I'll raise a hallelujah In the middle of the mystery I'll raise a hallelujah Oh fear you lost your hold on me We live for you. Yeah, we live. 
for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and
Hey guys, welcome to Axis Church, where everything we do revolves around Jesus. My name is Anthony, and I'm so privileged to have you tuning in with us tonight. I am uh, grateful that you are, because this is uh, the second part of a three-part series that has to do with the, uh, the fact that God is the ultimate authority in every situation. And we started our discourse and conversation last week on Isaiah 33, 22, which is a verse that says, The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. And in a season where we're looking to a lot of different people to help us out with a lot of different things, we need to remember inevitably who is in control. His name is Jesus. He doesn't get frazzled. He doesn't get caught off guard. He doesn't even have anything dawn on him. You know how you and I was there? You know what dawned on me? Nothing dawns on him because he's already knowing everything that's going to happen. So as we have this conversation tonight, I pray that you will be blessed in understanding that if he is our judge, which we talked about last week, if you want to learn more about that, go back, watch that YouTube video. We also need to understand that he's the lawgiver. And remember that our American government was broken down in three branches, the judicial the executive and the legislative branches to have checks and balances with one another so no one would be able to overwhelm one another in power. No one branch could stand out and take over. So if our systems in America were set up to try to keep things checks and balanced, we need to recognize that we have seen some inconsistencies in that. We have seen some brokenness in that. But God, his government will reign forever. And as we look at who we're talking about tonight, remember that the God that we serve has given us what we call the law. And we're going to talk about the law tonight because he is the law giver. Now, the legislative branch is made up of two houses of Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives. The most important duty of the legislative branch is to make laws. Laws are written, discussed, and voted on in Congress. So what exactly is a law? Remember, I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. They signed your bill. Now you're a law. Oh, yeah. That was in Saturday morning cartoons. Stop laughing, Emmanuel. That was Saturday morning cartoons when I was a little kid growing up. But a law is the purpose. uh, The purpose of law is to limit and contain harm to others. To limit or contain harm to others. And the definition is the system of rules that a particular country or community recognizes as regulating the actions of its members and may enforce by the imposition of penalties. In other words, it, it, there's, there's checks and balances. There's boundaries set up. Uh, we actually can have what we call legislation of morality in our nation because it's something that keeps people safe. And morally, we would say that if you're going to drive a, a vehicle— that you have to put your seatbelt on. And one season in our nation's history, when the automobile came into existence, that wasn't something that was thought of. But inevitably, it became a law because they saw that the impact of accidents with people not wearing seatbelts was cataclysmic. So now seatbelts have to be worn to keep everybody safe. Remember growing up in a home where you as a kid were sitting on your mother's lap? I got stitches right here. Stitches, I tell you, because my mom hit the brakes and my face hit the dashboard. I say yay to seatbelts. So let's understand that there are things that the government can say that are put in place for our protection. It's called legislating morality. And as we look at laws that are set up in our land, well, John Adams said it this way, it is more important that innocence be protected than it is that guilt be punished. For guilt and crimes are so frequent in this world that they cannot all be punished. So the goal is here to protect the innocent, you know, and then protect and serve. That's what law enforcement does, that they would protect the innocent. And when we think about the fact that whoever is in authority really gets the opportunity to decide the law of the land, that's a big deal. Like when it comes to marriage and we think about how God is the creator and author of marriage and we have seen the laws of our land changed. For me, with a broken heart to see what our nation decides which should be acceptable in regards to what a marriage should look like as opposed to what God says, uh, a man and a woman. Jesus validated this. It's throughout Scripture, and we understand that. So when we see the laws of the land violate the laws of God, well, as a Christian, I have, I have, it's, I'm not have any tension in me. I just know that that's going to be an impossibility because God's law will always be paramount, will always... Uh, 
to coin a word, trump the laws of the land. And we need to keep our eyes on God's word and know what his law says because if the society we're in tells us to go against the grain of God's word, I, I never want to be in a place where I violate the law of the law giver. Uh, we act as lawgivers as well sometimes. It's funny because uh, the words to my 18-year-old and my 16-year-old could easily be, hey, as long as you're under the roof of my house, it's my rules. Got it? Um, I hope I don't sound that forcibly when I get upset. But we do that. We, we, we institute laws in our own little sphere of influence because we feel that this is how things are supposed to go. It's not uncommon for us, the one in authority to do those things. But growing up, I always believed that there was one lawmaker. I learned about him. In fact, I think many of you will understand. Hmm, let me see. If I think hard enough, maybe you can see him. I have a job for you to do. Now take this down. It's a difficult responsibility that you accept from the number one lawmaker, me. Okay, we're back. The Burger Meister Meister Burger. I think that's so much fun. I want Christmas to come. I want it to be cold, yet I don't. That's the tension inside right now. But let's move away from there. When it comes to the law, James 4.12 says this, There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Wow. What God is telling us is that he's given the law and he's going to make judgment on it. And when it comes to living our life in this world, we are subjected to the laws of God. Some of us haven't even realized it, but do you realize that God, uh, maybe you'll realize it now that I'm saying, realize, 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 that God has put into place the laws that have to do with our existence. Um, I think about the fact that there's the law of physics, that, that you can't get away from the laws of physics. They are, they are paramount. They're, they're in our face. They, they exist and you can't change them. The math is the math. It is what it is. The law of thermodynamics, of the law of gravity, I mean, I think we're all grateful that we don't just start walking and rise up. Imagine trying to eat your chicken parmesan. Hey, get over here, chicken palm. You know, uh, the law of gravity. How about the law of attraction? God established that. You know, uh, we think about uh, the heartbeat of a, a man and a woman, a woman and a man. We think about animals. I mean, think about how amazing that is when animals migrate to a certain location to spawn. I mean, that's crazy. They can, they can swim like hundreds or maybe thousands of miles to go to a certain place where maybe they were actually born into this world and then they go there to procreate and then die. Like the law of attraction, like this, this internal desire that God has placed in his creation. Only a sovereign, all-powerful God gets to tell the elements what they can and can't do. His name is Jesus and he is our judge and he is also our lawgiver. Not only do we have laws that keep our world in existence the way it is, it keeps our earth, you know, going around the sun the way it does and has it slanted on its axis in the exact degrees that it is so we have the proper seasons and the ability to have the oxygen to breathe that we have, but he's also given us laws to govern us as a people. Just like a nation that would have laws instilled to prayerfully protect the innocent and to punish injustice, he has given us laws. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. It's pretty intense. Here it is that in Genesis 1, it says, God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. That's a pretty good law. You got it, God. Then you have uh, that he told them to go eat. Eat all the seeded plants. You know, that's cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to eat. I'm going to break a world record. And when Adam was, a, you know, the only guy, I guess he, he had the world record of eating peaches or whatever it was. But in Genesis 2, it changed. It went from what, you know, go ahead, go do this, go do that, to don't do this. Don't do this. And that was to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then what happened in Genesis 3 is the devil got man to question the lawmaker. And whew, 
man, we see that in our nation right now. We question the lawmakers, and sometimes rightfully so, sometimes wrongfully. But when it comes to God, man, I am seeing so many people question the lawmaker to get in his face, to get in his grill and tell him, who do you think you are? I don't want anything to do with you or I'm going to live a life that's so despicable and so depraved. And I look at society and you can see the deterioration, the deterioration of just people's mindset of what normal should look like. And it's, it's really heartbreaking to be honest with you. And I'm going to encourage you that you would be ready to hear the words of truth that are spoken from God's house. Because there are many churches that are complying to the requests of society to change God's law. What's accepted when it comes to marriage or or sexual orientation, gender identity, things like that. And listen to this quote from Leonard Ravenhill. I heard somebody say, find a church where you're comfortable. That'll kill you. Go to a church where you're uncomfortable, where they preach about hell, where they stir your conscience, where you have to go back and do some repairs. Don't be lulled to sleep by some fancy choir. In other words, if the church isn't preaching truth, and if the church isn't saying something that makes you say, wait a second, what? Then you might be in a place that's so comfortable you can die. I pray that we cause you guys to say, what? And think things through thoroughly. When the enemy gets us to question the lawmaker, we get to see things thoroughly fall apart. Think about Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, the law. And that was given to us. Eight of those are thou shalt not, clear. And two others are how to treat something. So when we think about that, the Lord is the one who determines what is right and what is wrong, what is righteous and what is sin, what brings him joy or what breaks his heart. We don't get to choose what that is. He has already laid it out for us. Listen, his word is chock full of things that would instruct us on how to live a life that would please the Lord. If you look at Psalm 119, which is a really long psalm, I'll just give you the first few verses. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Listen to how many times decrees, statutes, law. It's said over and over how he longs to obey God. Well, how would he know how to obey God if he doesn't know what the law says? And this is our responsibility to know the law of God, to know what he requires of us, to walk humbly and and justly and, and to show mercy. But we need to understand that this word is filled with instruction for you and I to put a smile on God's face instead of breaking his heart. We don't get to decide what that looks like. He has already sent this word to us the way he wants us to have it. And it is our responsibility to live it through. When people say to me, oh, I believe in God, I love Jesus. And when Jesus' own words says, if you love me, you'll obey me. If someone says they love Jesus, but they've never read one gospel, if they've never listened to one sermon about the gospels, how can you tell me that you love Jesus if you don't even know what he taught? If you don't even know what he, you might say, well, I heard Easter, I heard about Easter and resurrection, all that. Guys, Gals, people, we need to know what he said. We cannot obey his law if we don't know what it is. As I look at this, I realize that even Jesus was about the law of God. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Father, what do you want? What do you say in this moment? That's what I want to do. The word in Hebrew is kalkak. And it means to engrave in stone. That's what the law means, to engrave in stone, to prescribe, to appoint, to decree. Very popular word, decree, in Christian circles. Jesus decreed these things. The Father decreed these things into existence. He is the one who established the law. The scribes would pen the laws of God on parchments, but the Lord wants us to have these laws written on our hearts. I have hidden your word in my heart, O God, that I might not sin against you. 
And like a doctor caring for the well-being of his patient, the lawgiver Jesus has prescribed for us a set of laws to help keep us healthy and bring us through the tough roads of life that we may have everlasting life in him. Think about Joshua 1.8. Keep this book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Man, I wonder how much time we've spent watching uh, streaming movies and TV series during stay-at-home orders and and we had all that time on our hands. And I wonder how much time we spent meditating on God's Word so that we would be prosperous and successful. And in, in the world that we live in, if we are not making God's word a priority, we are definitely playing roulette with our soul. Because man, the one thing I want to make sure that's right, no matter what, I know physically I can get sick. I know my body's going to deteriorate. You know, the Lord gave and the Lord take it the way, the whole thing that I say all the time. But the one thing I know for sure is I want my soul to be strong in the Lord. And I want to honor him. And I want to go after him. Matthew 1, 18 and 20. It said, when it came to Joseph and Mary, and he found out that she was pregnant, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, yet in mind to divorce her, divorce her quietly. It told us that he was a man who was faithful to the law. I want to be like Joseph. I want to be faithful to the law. And I can't keep the law. Neither, none of us can. That's where grace comes in. You know, we are saved by grace through faith. This is the gift of God, uh, not by works so that nobody can boast. So I'm grateful for this gift that God has given us called grace. But it doesn't mean that I shouldn't know God's law. It doesn't mean that I shouldn't put my best foot forward when it comes to with the Spirit's empowerment to honor God's law. Matthew 2, 4. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. That was Herod. And he was wanting to know where the, the astrological charts were lining up where it said that there was a star to be followed because that's what the Magi were looking for. We had seen his star and we come to worship him. And there were teachers of the law. And thank the Lord today that there are teachers of God's law, God's precepts, God's statutes, God's decrees. And we need to take them seriously. We need to put them into action and make them a part of our lives. In Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's law. And he wants us to know his law and to live in the light and the hope of God's law. There are three moral codes in Mosaic law. The moral code, I should say three codes. The moral code, the spiritual code, and the social code. The moral code nobody can fulfill. It's impossible. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They never change, and man can never fulfill them. The spiritual code or ordinance is, is the Messiah who came. That's, he gave us a spiritual code to live by Jesus. And then the social code is the laws that dictate the, the nation of Israel's existence. Them as a society. Some national laws as opposed to international laws, which is a conversation for another time. I want to read to you Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. It's curious. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So you see that? The righteous requirements of the law might be met in us when we live by the Spirit instead of pleasing ourselves and doing what our flesh desires. This is the contrast between the law of gravity. As I mentioned, God put laws in place. The law of gravity and the law of lift. I've spoke about this only uh, maybe two months ago. And the law of gravity is constant. But if you look at a plane or even a bird, they have what's called the law of lift. And they'll be able to overcome the law of gravity. But there's a time where that, that ability will run out. Even a bird has to land once in a while. A plane has to land. And if you allow sin, which God gives us the ability to rise up above, 
if you allow it to become something that is a part of your life, you are going to find yourself crashing and burning. Unlike a bird and unlike a plane, our fueling comes from the Holy Spirit, which is constant. So we could always rise above sin. We could always be able to overcome that law of sin. And that is by the, the Spirit who gives us life through Christ Jesus. Romans 10.4 says, Christ is the culmination of the law, so that many so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. There's enough righteousness to go around. Christ is the culmination of the law. In him, by believing in him, by believing God, we get credited as righteousness. God will impute that into our spiritual bank account. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Jesus took off the curse of the law, because none of us could have fulfilled it. We were all going to be judged as, uh, as defective, as depraved, as wretched. But Jesus became the curse. So when we put our hope and faith in him, now we have that, that curse removed. And we could stand right before God. And since it was God who gave us the law, it only makes sense that it is God who can meet the requirements of that law. He did it through Jesus. The perfect sacrifice. He who was without sin became sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God. Wow. Psalm 19.7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. So tonight, my heart is this. If you've been listening to this message and you maybe, you've been writing your own laws, you've been doing things your way, your decisions in life, the things that you do, they're contrary to God's word. Please know that you are breaking the law of God and you will be accountable for that. For those who stay in a state of brokenness before God, in a sinful state, they will be judged for their sins. And that is banishment from the Lord forever. That's a place called hell. And God doesn't want anybody going there. He doesn't. He, he died on a cross. That's how adamant he is that he does not want you to go to hell but he won't stop you if you insist on going. If you need to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, since we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, since we've all broken God's law, if you need to get right with God, do me a favor. Email me at anthony at accessmy.org and write three words, I need Jesus. And I will have a conversation with you. One of my staff will have a conversation with you and we will talk about your questions. We will talk about the wrestling match you might be having going on on the inside right now. But let's not forget, he's the judge. He will dictate who gets punished and who gets, who gets blessed. He is the lawgiver. He decides what's right and wrong, not you and I. He lays out the law of the land, one that needs to be followed more than anything else. Let me pray for you. Lord, I ask that you will be with the church today. I pray that you'll be with those who are listening today, that we will recognize the amazing, the amazing truths that you've given us through your word, that we, Lord God, would walk in the flavor of, of the Bible as opposed to the flavor of the world. That we will honor you, Lord, because then we will receive your favor. And we pray today, Lord God, that we will know your law, that we will know what your word says, and then as Paul says, then do it. That we will make it happen, Lord God, because long before Nike said, just do it, we know that the living God told us to just do it. And we will, Lord. We will put our hands to the plow. We won't look back we won't complain. We won't get mad. We will simply say, Lord, give me the next step to take in this journey. We thank you, Father, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for the law that restores our soul. Help us to feel that restoration. Help us to honor you that when we lay our heads on the pillow at night, we won't have to worry about what we did wrong and try to hide it. Instead, we will know that you're smiling down saying like you did in the book of Job chapter 1, have you considered my servant for there is none like him? And we could put our name in that slot. Have we considered my servant? There is none like them. Thank you, Lord, for your law. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and raising from the grave. Thank you for being our righteousness. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you and have a God almighty night. Amen.